We are at the cusp of a major crossroads in Connecticut. Through the Dalio Education Report last October, we found out that our state has a great unspoken crisis. Young people from early adolescence through young adulthood are becoming disconnected. They are tuning out in school, not entering the workforce, and in essence, they are disappearing before our eyes. We know they are there, and often we know who they are, but it seems like there's nothing we can do. But some want to do something, and today we're joined by Lisa Tepper Bates, President and CEO of the United Way of Connecticut, to talk about what can be done about this crisis and others. The Municipal Voice is the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities podcast in collaboration with WNHH LP 103.5 FM. I'm your host, Matt Ford. As always, be sure to give us a like and let us know what you're thinking in the comments. CCM's Municipal Voice podcast continues to present a key forum on important state local issues. The views expressed do not necessarily reflect the consensus views of CCM or member municipal leaders. Lisa, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. I think, you know, most of us have heard of the United Way, but not everyone necessarily knows exactly what it is that you do there. Can you tell us what the United Way does and what your role is there? Sure. Uh, so United Way of Connecticut uh, is actually a couple of things. We mm -hmm. are the association of the local United Ways in Connecticut. There are 14. Okay. Uh, at the same time, uh, we provide, uh, in partnership with our state agencies, a number of important services for the state of Connecticut. So mm -hmm. we provide 211, which is a basic needs help referral line. Uh, we also provide 988, which is the suicide and crisis lifeline for Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, and we administer the state of Connecticut child care subsidy, care for kids, and we provide resources and referral to child care, among other things. Those are yeah. just our core services. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really are a service provider to the people of our state more than anything. That's really great. And how did you get involved and in, in what do you do? Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I have just had my uh, four-year anniversary at United. All right. Congratulations. As president and CEO, it's an honor and a privilege every day uh, to do this work and to lead the team. Uh, I had the honor to work with United Way of Connecticut for many years in my previous capacities in Connecticut, uh, including when I was running a small shelter for families facing homelessness mm -hmm. and in my work as the head of the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness, coordinating the work of shelters and housing providers across the state in partnership with two and one. So the yeah. team at United Way of Connecticut was very familiar to me. And when my predecessor retired, uh, I, you know, had the privilege to be chosen to, to lead this great organization. Is it true the United Way of Connecticut doesn't just operate the two one one centers for the state of Connecticut, but for other places as well? Um, we do provide some backup services for other uh, states, especially in the Northeast. Yeah. Uh, and right now, for example, we're offering some extra help to our colleagues who are working with, uh, with U.S. residents in terrible need after Helene in the South. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the 211 network across the country provides backup. Uh, in to each other in terrible events like this. Uh, but but that's right. Primarily, we serve uh, the residents of Connecticut, mm -hmm. but we also do provide some additional services outside of our state boundaries. Yeah. How did, how did like little Connecticut kind of assume that role helping out the other states? Were we just a leader on that? Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad to tell you, Matt, that we are indeed a leader in the 2-on-1 national network, uh, Connecticut's 2-on-1 system, which is a, a long partnership with the state, uh, is, a, is a real leader in the nation, both in terms of our database and our uh, web technology mm -hmm. and in terms of our contact center. Uh, but it is, it's very standard that in a situation like this terrible, terrible storm, uh, that 2-on-1s come to each other's aid uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that we can help people who need some place to call and find out where do I find shelter? Where do I find clean water? Uh, so that's what some of our folks are helping to do right now. But primarily every day, we're helping the residents of Connecticut, whether they need utility assistance, mm -hmm. or they're facing homelessness, uh, or through our, our 988 work, we're helping people facing a mental health crisis or their family or friends who might be calling to find out how to help them. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Helene and everything, and but prior to that, I know in Connecticut we had that flooding in the Nugget River Valley. Do you guys get involved with any of that stuff? 
We absolutely do. We are a, a part a partner in the state emergency management team. Mm. So anytime there's a storm or uh, or power outages or these types of, of terrible events, whether natural or sadly man-made, mm -hmm. uh, call the, the terrible experience of Connecticut during Sandy Hook, uh, our call centers are part of the response to be there mm. to help people, to answer questions, to direct them to the resources that they need in that moment. And then I imagine afterwards, the 988 also comes into effect sometimes too. Absolutely. Um, one of the reasons we had you on today is that we've been working on the 119K Commission. Uh, which today, earlier today, uh, released the Young People First report, which we've been working on a long time. And United Way has been a large supporter uh, of the work uh, you know, to combat this crisis since the very beginning. But just in case they haven't heard about it yet, what is Connecticut's unspoken crisis of disconnected and at-risk youth? Yeah, well, Matt, I first want to really shout out to uh, CCM and Joe DeLong for uh, taking on a, a real leadership role with regard to this crisis of what we refer to as disconnected youth. CCM has been working with the Dalio Philanthropies uh, to understand better what is going on, what is this crisis, why are so many of our young people disconnected. And that's what the report is about. And together with support from, uh, from Dalio, uh, we do have this report that tells us that fully 119,000 young people in our state are either not completing their education, uh, even at the high school level, um, or even if they are completing that education, they aren't successfully entering the workforce yeah. and finding a way, a path to thrive and contribute and achieve a, uh, a stability in their own lives. Uh, so that's what the report, that's where the, the report started was with the understanding of who's out there, who are these young people and what are the, the factors contributing to, to this problem for our state and for these young people. Uh, and then together with CCM, uh, they took on the, the challenge of saying, all right, now that we've scoped out what this problem is, mm -hmm. what can we do? What needs to be done here? Uh, yeah. This isn't acceptable for our young people. It's not good for the state of Connecticut. So we do need to act on it. Uh, and so we're, we're grateful to the 119K Commission, um, which Joe helped to lead with Andrew Ferguson. Um, and we're very grateful to the many municipal leaders and mayors who have served on that commission yeah. uh, and heard from the public and heard from, from folks like, like me. Uh, I was honored to speak at the first public hearing of the commission yeah. uh, and to provide the thoughts that I could provide from our perspective about what we could do to better yeah. serve these young people. Yeah, as you mentioned, you, throughout this process, we had uh, groups coming together of stakeholders and experts and you know the youth themselves were involved. And from the get-go, the United Way has stood, you know, by that report, championing the work and, um, as you said, participating in some of the early roundtables that the 119K Commission had. Um, it might seem self-evident uh, to your organization, but why did this work resonate with you? Why support it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, our work as United Way of Connecticut uh, centers on helping Connecticut residents, all Connecticut residents, to thrive so, you know, what does that mean? It means connecting people to resources so they can find a pathway to address their basic needs and then go further to advance their stability and their security and make the most of who they are, mm -hmm. contribute the most that they can to Connecticut, provide the best they can for themselves and their families. Um, so that touches on a lot of different yeah. parts of our population, from the very, very young, from mm -hmm. babies and children all the way to our elderly. Uh, and so this report um, really touches on so many areas of that because it's about families mm -hmm. and it's about young people. Uh, and for us, uh, solving for these challenges is what we're all about. So mm -hmm. we're excited to partner with CCM and, and we're really, really pleased to see this report and to see the recommendations that this important panel reached in their explorations. Yeah, as, as you think it's important that you mention the families and stuff. I heard over and over again at these meetings, you know, obviously we got to help the kids, but part of helping those kids is, is looking at the families too, because if something's not right at home, how can they learn in school and things like that? It was 
important message to get through there that it's not just the kids it's not just during the time they're at school it's it's a holistic sort of approach that's exactly right matt all of us all of us came from a family yeah. and it's, it's very well understood that uh the the more stability there is in the family the better the odds are that that young person will have what they need to find their path to address their own challenges, to weather the difficult experience of adolescence, yeah. and, and to, to make the most of their talents and skills and abilities. Uh, and what we know at United Way of Connecticut uh, is that too many families in our state are struggling financially. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what that often means, when you're so worried about paying the bills, about paying the rent, keeping a roof over your head and your children's, putting food on the table, keeping the lights on, that pressure crushes the space that families have to support each other, to, to create the grounds, to really focus on their kids, to provide that stability and that calmness that yeah. we know that kids need uh, as they travel through high school and, and figure out how to do the best that they can. 40% uh, of our families in the state of Connecticut are what we call Alice, uh, asset limited, income constrained and employed. Our most recent report mm -hmm. on Alice, on really what it takes to make ends meet in Connecticut, yeah. has just come out. And what's unfortunate about that is that we know that we're, we're headed the wrong direction. We have more families who are struggling mm -hmm. than ever before. 13% increase in those households living paycheck to paycheck since yeah. our last report. Uh, and that, that stress, you know, just as we were saying, is part of why youth end up disconnected from their families, disconnected from their school systems, unable to find a path that will allow them stability, allow them to, to contribute best to our state and to, to really thrive on their own. Uh, so we're big believers in finding paths to make mm -hmm. it easier for these hardworking Connecticut residents and to relieve their stress. The report calls out in this regard the importance of the federal child tax credit mm -hmm. uh, and also shines a light on a state level child tax credit to mm -hmm. put some additional funds back in the wallets of these families and to yeah. relieve some of that stress, which can very easily become toxic for yeah. every member of the family, including the young kids. And talking about Alice and the cost of living in Connecticut, you know, it sounds to me like, is this almost like a more specific version of like when we talk about the national, um, you know, poverty figures and stuff where there's, there's these figures that they gave us for, you know, the poverty line in the, the nation, but Connecticut comparatively to other places is so much more expensive to live in that even if it works somewhere else in this country, it wouldn't necessarily work here. So is Alice in part like drilling down on the realities on the ground in Connecticut itself? Yeah, thank you. Matt. That's, there, there, there are two pieces to that question. And, and part, I'd say, is, is about the fact that the federal poverty line, what a lot of people in America would refer to, to think about who is struggling and who is mm -hmm. not. Uh, the federal poverty line doesn't actually tell us what we think it does. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, an, it's an inaccurate representation of the question, what does it take to make ends meet? Yeah. Um, and what Alice provides is a real cost based mm. way to understand what does it take to pay your rent, to pay for transportation, to put food in, on the table, to pay for child care yeah. so you can work in our state. Uh, and, and the difference is pretty stark. Uh, by the measures of the federal poverty line, you would understand that 11.5% of our population as a nation is quote unquote poor or falls yeah. below the poverty line. The average person would think that everyone above the poverty line then must be able to make ends meet. And that's yeah. simply not true. Uh, but when you look at Alice, Alice tells you what does it take to pay for those basics and, and who is making that much or not? Mm -hmm. And so what we understand from those real cost measures provided in the Alice report is that fully 39 plus percent of our population in this state are barely making their bills paycheck to mm -hmm. paycheck and not able to create a cushion for savings, often falling behind. 
We know that people are increasingly using credit cards to pay for basics, to pay for groceries, Mm -hmm. to pay for their utility bills. Uh, And that means they're falling behind on paying for just the basics. Um, So so that's the difference. Um, And as you said, uh, in Connecticut, that Alice threshold, as we call it, that line below which you're really not making ends meet consistently, uh, that is a higher amount than in many other states. Because Mm -hmm. as great as the quality of living is in Connecticut, we know that our costs are higher than in many other places. Yeah. And you hear sometimes when people talk about this issue that I don't know if it's the case in Connecticut, but in many places in the country, a person working full time at minimum wage can't even hit the that basic level of of income that they need oh absolutely yeah you know you have to work some insane amount of hours like the one could actually do at minimum wage to like make that kind of minimum living in connecticut no that's right and and that's why you often hear about people who work at minimum wage jobs having to work two sometimes three jobs yeah make ends meet Uh, And, and, you know, and there are a lot of good people in this state who will do what they have to do to put food on the table. But when a parent is working two, two and a half, three jobs, they're not home and they're Mm -hmm. not able to be present for their children. So again, Matt, that feeds into what are the factors creating disconnection? You know, teenagers who are at home on their own, no supervision and no support, a lot of the time, that's part of what creates the disconnection. That's some trouble wise. You are listening to the Municipal Voice on WNHH 103.5 FM. You spoke at one of our early roundtables uh, for the commission. What concerns you the most about this group of disconnected and at risk youth? I think what concerns me the most is that um, when a young person gets off track and becomes disconnected early in life, it can be very, very hard for them to get back on track Mm -hmm. uh, and to to get to a place where they can support themselves, they can be healthy, Mm -hmm. and they can, in turn, at the point in their life where they might have a life partner, uh, Mm -hmm. might have children of their own, provide the best stability and the most nurturing environment for the family. Yeah. So if we can prevent that disconnection, help more of these young people find a place of stability, launch successfully into the adult world, Yeah. we've done something that will carry forward for a very long time and for their own children. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, Matt, uh, sadly, there's a lot of negative cost. For, the, or for our state, for our public systems, mm-hmm. associated with the, with the disconnection of these youth. Yeah. So we'd rather be investing proactively in their success up front than paying on the back end for incarceration, for substance use treatment, for mental health crises that could yeah. have been avoided if they'd had the tools and the stability and the support earlier. Yeah. I know in some of the meetings, uh, one of the commissioner, Andrew, we talk about, you know, if the moral case to do this doesn't compel you, the financial case should, because not only do we save the money by not paying for incarceration stuff, but if they have good jobs, they're paying taxes. You know, That's right. It's, it's, it's contributing on the other side, even. And Matt, we yeah. need these young people in our workforce. Yeah, um, we're, we're short jobs. There's open jobs in this state. Yeah. And, and not just a handful. Uh, the last number I saw was 90,000. Yeah, 90,000 jobs. We need people in those positions. So we need these these young people, as much as they may need our support to to help them find that place of stability and join the workforce, we need them to do that. Yeah. So it's we need the next generation of workers in the state. We do and we need them right now. That's yeah. exactly There's already a lot of things that are short. Yeah. Um your two on one number that we've talked about a bit could be an avenue to help these at risk and disconnected youth. Tell us more about that and how maybe it could be adapted to help even further. 
Yeah, so Matt, uh, United Way of Connecticut, as we said, very proudly provides the 211 information and referral service for people who have urgent basic needs. And we're available 24 uh, 7 and on the web at 211CT. Dot org. Uh, we were very excited to see that the report lifts up the important opportunity to create a specialized team at 211 mm. and some specialized ways that we could better connect with young people who are in crisis, facing disconnection, uh, and provide help. Yeah. Uh, so we're excited to see that. Uh, and 211, again, is available 24 hours a day. And that's important because yeah. anyone who, who may have parented a teenager or no one knows that they don't always work in the hours that we do. Yeah. Uh, they might be thinking at two in the morning, I'm ready to turn my life around. I'm ready to enter the workforce. I, I want to address these things. I need some support yeah. uh, so that our team is able to be there for them uh, at whatever hour. Uh, works best for them is really important. Um, and also in the report, they lifted up the fact that, uh, you know, we're all learning that young people interact and want to interact in ways that are not what they might have been 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, so having uh, forward-leaning text and chat platforms, having user-friendly ways for them to access services mm. on their smartphone, that is increasingly important. Yeah. Uh, and the report lifts up the opportunity that with the right resources, uh, our 2 in one team could build out some forward-leaning tools, could have a specialized team to serve these disconnected youth and youth in crisis. Mm. Uh, and Matt, importantly, it taps into an, a, a really great opportunity to have some funds that could be available immediately mm. to meet the needs of a young person. And so let me give you an example, Matt. You could have a young person who is couch surfing, trying to, to sort of pull it together, mm -hmm. has put in some job applications, and now their cell phone's gone dead because they couldn't pay the bill. Yeah. They have no way to interact with that employer. Everything now is very much based on, we'll text you, we'll get back to you by email, fill out the application online. Mm -hmm. So that cell phone is a lifeline for so many of these young people. So with the flexible fund, that's, pro that, that's uh, proposed in the 119K commission report, mm -hmm. our team, if this young person called up and said, look, my cell phone's dead, I'm yeah. waiting on some, some job applications, we could help them to resolve that small but critically important problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could make all the difference in them, you know, picking up the phone when that job offer comes through. That's exactly right find them where they are sort of, you know, communicate in the way that they're used to communicating. These kids that are texting and online all the time, they don't often necessarily pick up the phone and make a phone call to, especially after someone they don't even know. And something we used to do all the time back in the day, you know, and just pick up the phone and dial it and someone picks up. But now it's almost a strange thing to get a phone call on your cell phone for some people. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, although I would say that the great thing too is that if they make that connection via text or chat, mm -hmm. but it turns out that what they really need is someone to talk with, mm -hmm. then you've provided that connection and you can transition to an actual conversation with a live human being. Yeah, and I imagine that, that first talk. connection is is a big part of the battle. Like if they've gone as far as to reach out, that that's a, a large part of the, the thing right there already. That's exactly right. And so you wanna be there, you wanna be there quickly. Uh, and, you know, for those occasions where chat is going to work best for them, that's great. Mm -hmm. when, they, when they want and need to talk with a human being, then we want to be available. Uh, and that's part of what the report calls out, uh, mm -hmm. that it's critical to have the bandwidth. So you're yeah. not saying, please hold for 15 or 20 minutes. Yeah. And, you know, people are going to be learning as they read this new report. There's a whole suite of recommendations coming from the 119K Commission. Um, and these are going to take time, you know, no doubt. But to solve this crisis or kind of even put a dent in it, we feel like we need comprehensive action. Why do you think we need to go bold on this? Well, I think, Matt, for all the reasons we've discussed, uh, there's a, a, a human cost to this, which uh, is just too, too high for us to, in this day and age, tolerate the suffering of these young people mm -hmm. uh, 
it's extraordinary and it's terrible and we can do better by them. Yeah. Imagine yourself at 17, 18, 19, disconnected from supports, feeling alone, feeling hopeless, not able to see a path. Yeah. We got to do better by those young people. And as we said, this is critical for the state of Connecticut. We have a, a 119K commission size hole in our workforce. Yeah. And we could fill that if we can help these young people find their path, feel supported, connect to these jobs. Yeah. So again, it's a win-win and it's urgent. Uh, and this report balances, I think, really masterfully. What are the things we can and should do quickly? Mm -hmm with what are the longer term issues that we all need to work on together. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's really important. We want to be realistic about uh, the fact that, you know, resources are always limited. Mm -hmm. So let's start with what's most urgent. Uh, and the report does a great job of calling out the fact that we have services for young people that are mm -hmm. working. Yeah. Let's resource them better to meet the needs of more young people. Mm -hmm. And, Let's make sure to think differently about the resources that we already have and maximize those by coordinating them yeah. and bringing them together around the families and the kids who need help, rather than asking those families, those young people to go knock on a dozen different doors to find mm -hmm. the help that they need. Yeah. And how important is it, I guess, to the United Way that this action is not just comprehensive, but coordinated, you know? The agencies, nonprofits, and municipalities kind of all not just talk to each other, but kind of share data and even coordinate services. Well, you know, Matt, it, it's it's simply critically important if you really want to make a difference. Uh, and we've seen this in other aspects of social service provision in mm -hmm. Connecticut and across the country. And and frankly, it just makes sense. Yeah. If a client comes to you and what they need is one third what you offer and one third what some other provider offers. And then there's a hole that you don't know how to fill. It would make so much sense if you could share that information with the provider who can meet that other third. Mm -hmm. And then you can draw on your whole network of providers to say, and there's this gap here who can help fill it. Yeah. Right. And right now without that kind of coordination, and Matt, in the you know 15 years I've been working in nonprofit social services in Connecticut, I've seen this over and over, mm -hmm. right? You've got these providers who have a person in front of them and they'll spend all day on the phone calling around, trying to fix it, not yeah. knowing that this same person might have had a similar experience across town yesterday with a different mm -hmm. number. Yeah. They might have already <laughs> filled out all the forms and done the things. Who knows? Yeah. Right. Right. And, and we didn't know that. So it's a waste of, of precious time and effort mm -hmm. on all sides, on the side of this person who's in urgent need and potentially in crisis. Yeah. And for the service providers trying to help them. And in homelessness, what we found is that when we could have one shared way to understand mm. what clients in, in our shared area of operations needed, and we could sit down as teams, and we, yeah. could, we could go from no plan to a comprehensive plan much more quickly. Mm -hmm. And when we were all working in silos, unaware of who was serving who and what were, what were we offering where, yeah. it really just makes sense. And it allows us to maximize the resources that we already have. Because Yeah, the, the efficiency said, to, you know, there's only so much money, but if you're being more efficient right. with it, you're helping more people with that same amount of money, yeah. That's exactly right. Uh, and so what, what one of the other great aspects of the report is that it does report, re, excuse me, it does propose exactly this kind of regional coordination, mm -hmm. pull providers together in teams to come around the youth or the youth and their family to provide a comprehensive way forward. Um, and, and that's, I think, really brilliant. And, and we we wholeheartedly support that. And, and we're ready to, to play our role as a partner. Mm -hmm. That's great. So we mentioned there's a whole bunch of actions in, in this plan and, you know, it's going to take a lot of time. But if you had to pick one kind of be put in place for October 10th, you know, the next day, what would it be? 
Well, Matt, that's a hard question to ask me because, of course, one of the recommendations is about our two-on-one service. Um, but I, I have to say um, that that really is where I'd start mm-hmm. uh, because through enhancing our service on two-on-one, we're not only going to be able to serve more of these young people ourselves, mm-hmm. but we're going to be able to connect them yeah. to these other service providers across the state more efficiently and more effectively than we can now. Mm-hmm. And we're going to be able to start pulling in more and better data on what they tell us they need and want. Yeah. Uh, and again, that's another piece of, of the data. We need more data on that. Uh, what do they need? What do they most want? How can we collectively serve them best? Uh, mm-hmm. And then we're going to share that information and have those conversations with our partners yeah. so that together we can keep making the system better and better. Uh, But I also want to call out the fact that the report refers to the fact that we know there are young people right now ready to engage with service providers who can help them get their feet on a path Mm -hmm. and resources at those existing fantastic youth services providers are not adequate to just serve the youth who've raised their hands and say, I'm ready. Can you help me? Um, So that's also an important priority. You know, let, let's at least start there. Help the yeah. youth raise their hands. We're ready to come into that program, come into that job training and get started. Yeah. This connection is such a wide issue and it's wider than, you know, just children of a certain age. And we have to assume when we look at this report and it focuses on the young people that as they get older, they don't magically become connected after they, they age out. Uh, the United Way, we talked about this earlier, has a figure group of people called ALICE the asset limited income restrained, constrained employed. Can you talk a little bit more about Alice? Why, who are these people and why does that matter? Yeah, and you know, as, as we referred to very briefly earlier, Alice is this population in our state who are working as hard as they can at the jobs available to them and still struggling to make ends meet or falling behind. Mm-hmm. Even Matt, if they are working two, two and a half, three jobs, yeah. Uh, and, and that population in our state are doing some of the most critical work. These, mm-hmm. are, the, uh, these are the assistants to nurses in our hospital. Mm-hmm. They are driving the school bus, taking your kids to work, yeah. uh, excuse me, to school. Uh, they are the, the folks who are working in our child care, taking care of, of infants and toddlers while their parents are at work. Mm-hmm. These are critical jobs. And yet... We know that all day long, these folks are thinking about, how am I going to keep paying my bills? Yeah. And so, so that hurts us. That, that hurts their ability to focus on what's most important, mm-hmm. which is taking care of someone in the hospital, taking care of your child at daycare. Um, and, and we've got to do better, right? Yeah. They're, they're doing critical work and they can't make ends meet. Um, and, you know, again, part of what uh, we believe a, a, a proven and practical solution is, is to provide at the state level a child tax credit. Mm. So that especially for Alice families who are raising kids, they can have a little bit more in the way of flexible funding Mm. to meet their needs or the needs of their kids. Uh, That's one piece of the the solution, Mm. uh, not the whole of the solution, uh, but we think it's an important place to start. Yeah, something that the, the legislature could do this session to, to help out. That's right. That's exactly right. And kind of in closing, while the issues that CCM and the United Way tackle are big issues, are you optimistic about the future? Do you feel that we have the momentum to make that transformative change necessary? And if so, why do you feel that way? Uh, you know, you're, you're right. These are the big challenges and they're the, the most important challenges that we face as a state. Uh, and so, you know, again, I'm grateful to CCM and, and Joe DeLong for the leadership uh, on this important issue. And yes, I, I am optimistic that we can make a difference. Uh, as the, you know, as the report lies out, so many of these things are, are doable. They're mm-hmm. right there. They're, they're right within our grasp. Uh, we just have to have the will. Uh, we have to find a little bit in the way of resources to get started. Uh, but the, the return on this investment in human terms for the young people that we can help mm-hmm. and for our state in terms of filling those jobs that are unfilled, 
having more uh, young people enter the workforce, become uh, contributors to their communities, contributors to our tax base. Yeah. The, the win is a, it's a big one. Yeah. Uh, so I, I know that we can make headway on this. We have now a really good roadmap in the way of this report. Um, I know we can do it. We just have to commit yeah. and, and follow the report and get it done. And I know we can. We'd like to thank our guest, Lisa Tepper Bates of the United Way. The Municipal Voice is a co-production by CCM and WNHH 103.5 FM. Joseph Thornton is our executive producer. Christopher Gilson is our producer. Harry Draws is on the boards. And I'm Matt Ford, your host. Be sure to check out our Facebook page and give us a like. And watch out for our CCM chat series on our YouTube page.